I hope everyone had a terrific uh, dinner last night at your breakout dinners and uh, also a great time at the Night Owls and maybe a little bit of time at the bar. Uh, and we've already kicked off the morning uh, in a terrific fashion with a very interesting and important discussion trying to understand America. Uh, and we're going to now move uh, to, the, to the morning plenary, starting off uh, with Senator Chris Murphy and uh, Bundestag member Norbert Rotkin. Looking forward to that opening conversation. And we have a great morning planned. Uh, after that, we'll have the president of Georgia and others talking about Euro-Atlantic integration. And then a very timely and important and I think interesting session on the North Korea threat. And closing out the day, talking about from where we began with Bob Kagan's statement uh, on geostrategy. So to set up the morning, I'd like to introduce a brief video. We know what the problems are. Simply discussing them isn't enough. It is imperative that we come together and resolve them. The Marshall Plan rebuilt Europe after World War II using principles of cooperation. The transatlantic partnership that emerged from that era is still vital. We all face challenges within our societies, but we know that we will be strongest when we rise to meet them together. Experience has shown that a spirit of trust is the key to solving our problems. When we come together, we can overcome obstacles that seem insurmountable. We need to reestablish the trust within and between our societies. We will revise, we will reboot, and we will rebuild. Excellent. And to start us off, I'd like to introduce Florian Ader from Politico. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Good morning to all of you. And in particular, to those welcome back to Brussels Forum on Saturday morning, on the warm Saturday morning. It's almost spring outside in Brussels. Uh, while we talk about the transatlantic relations and leadership that are uh, in deep winter, as it seems. Uh, good morning to all of you, also to those who didn't make it to the first session to the breakfast. Um, understanding America, I saw it was crowded, it was full, so there is obviously a need to understand each other even better in the future. Welcome. Uh, Norbert Röttgen, a member of the German Bundestag for uh, Chancellor Merkel's CDU, the Christian Democrats, and the chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee of the Bundestag, and Senator Chris Murphy from Connecticut from the Democratic Party. Good to have you here, and I'm looking, I look forward to our discussion here. Gentlemen, as we're supposed to discuss the future of transatlantic leadership, and as we've seen and as we will see, there's a lot to discuss, I would like to start off with uh, an issue of, a, of, a, of very different transatlantic sensitivities, let me say. Uh, Senator, how come that Americans hold the freedom of carrying firearms so much dearer than the freedom of having health insurance? Can you explain that to us here in Brussels on, for, uh, to a European audience? <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I always remember getting a, a phone call uh, shortly after uh, I began my time in the Senate from uh, Matthew Barzin, who at the time was our ambassador to England, and he talked about uh, going around to schools in England shortly after arriving and handing out two index cards to all of the kids. W he asked them to write on one uh, a word that embodied something they respected or liked about America, and on the other to write a word that uh, embodied something that they were frustrated with or didn't understand about America. And he called me because he was amazed that on 70% of the cards of the second variety, there was the same word. And he asked if I knew what it was. I guessed perhaps at the time, this was in 2013, uh, that it was spying or it was Iraq. Uh, it wasn't, the word was guns. Uh, the, 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 the misunderstanding um, that in these kids' minds between their values and the United States values uh, was about why we had done nothing to try to address this epidemic of gun violence. Um, and so um, this is something that I try to explain both in terms of, of practical domestic realities, but also something that divides us from many of our friends here in Europe and across the globe. Um, uh, this unfortunately is in the United States just a matter of 
power dynamics. The uh, gun industry has an enormous uh, amount of clout and power. It is um, gradually dissipating, and the forces that want to have stronger laws to make sure that what happened in Sandy Hook, which happened in my district, or what happened just a few weeks ago in Florida, never happens again. It likely will take an election whereby a number of people who are voting against these reforms that are broadly supported by the public lose their seats. Um, if that happens, um, then we can get some uh, real change. Um, but uh, this is, um, uh, you know, this is, listen, this is a, a very uniquely American conversation. We have the Second Amendment. Um, guns are a big part of our history, beginning with the uh, attempt by the British to seize a store of arms that uh, the colonists uh, had on the Green and Lexington through the settlement of the West, done primarily through firearms. Um, but uh, the Second Amendment is not absolute, just like the First Amendment. And ultimately, I think after we get through an election or two, uh, we'll be able to have a settlement here where we you know, ma maintain their uh, Second Amendment rights while also putting in some of these reforms that will stop these tragedies. So but it's a power question at the end rather than a question of sentiment or uh, uh, culture. Everybody, you know, there was a popular line after uh, 20 children in my state lost their lives. People said, well, you know, if, if Sandy Hook didn't change the debate, it, it, then what will? Uh, yeah. 20 kids being killed. And, and, and that's not how this debate, unfortunately, is going to work. There's not a tipping point. Um, it, it really is a matter of uh, the anti-gun violence movement being strong enough in the polls to uh, ultimately convince politicians to break from their historical identity with the gun industry. No, but Röttgen, is then hard for you to explain to your constituency, to your voters, you know America well and you, uh, you're uh, a foreign policy guy. Have you ever understood uh, that, that question? <laughs> um, I, I think I, I try, I always try to understand. Uh, and partly I try hard to understand America and American political debates. And I try to explain something in my constituency, what is going on in the United States. But I think I have not to understand everything and to explain everything what is happening in the United States. <laughs> well said. <laughs> yeah. you, ju you just mentioned what happened a few weeks ago in Florida and Parkland. Are, there, are we not looking closely enough from Europe over here if you think that things are actually getting into motion, that there is movement on uh, gun control? Well, there was this extraordinary meeting at the White House that got an enormous amount of attention in the in the states. I'm not sure how much coverage it got here, uh, in which the president brought Republicans and Democrats um, uh, into the West Wing and uh, made some groundbreaking commitments. He w walked out of that meeting seeming to have announced his support for universal background checks, making sure that people prove that they're not a criminal or seriously mentally ill before they buy a gun, um, other major reforms <coughs> that would make a difference. Um, but then about 24 hours later, he walked back all of those uh, commitments, which we've become used to. He did the same thing on immigration, having announced in a big televised White House meeting that he wanted to uh, try to solve this problem of young kids who came here. Uh, with their parents uh, when they were very young and then in the days after did nothing to actually follow up on those commitments. So, um, uh, you know, I, I think the president is, you know, very comfortable putting on uh, reality show presentations in the White House, uh, not as comfortable actually following up on those commitments and getting something done and that seems to be what's happening on the issue of guns. Is America a question for both of you? Is America, which of course, as we all know, is the model of Western democracies that don't need royals to function, uh, too old or too young a country to ever fundamentally change its, its constitutions, as you just mentioned, the, the Second Amendment is not absolute, but if not, now we in Germany, we've had around 50 or 50 something changes of the Grundgesetz, of the, of the basic law over the past 60 years. Uh, in America, there aren't that many. So, the question. <coughs> Well, you know, we, we haven't made as many uh, changes, but if your question is whether we're going to, you know, change this particular uh, amendment to the Constitution, the answer is no, um, and we don't need to. For the uh, time being, the Second Amendment, uh, as interpreted by the Supreme Court, allows for you to, um, you know, both regulate the type of people who have <coughs> firearms uh, and uh, regulate the type of firearms they own. And, um, you know, this in our country is a public health issue. Uh, the the, the, the the press sort of surrounds these mass shootings. Um, but in certain neighborhoods in the United States, the most violent neighborhoods, what we have found is that children's brains um, are 
changed, are fundamentally altered by the trauma they go through every single day, fearing for their life as they walk to school. And in the, um, you know, and, and in the United States of America, the idea that that happens in dozens of cities is abhorrent. Uh, the Second Amendment it doesn't stop you from passing common sense regulations to try to address uh, that horror. Is it actually helpful advice, or is it, would it be helpful for your partners over here in Europe to advise on how to deal with those things, or is that more of an uh, uh, advice that's not helpful in the end? Um, no, I mean, we, we certainly you know, look to uh, other countries' experiences, and what we say all the time <coughs> is, um, listen, um, for those that want to blame this problem in the United States on mental illness or on school security, um, just look to the rest of the world. Uh, the United States has no greater level of mental illness than any country in Europe. Those kids that we're talking about, um, you know, they exist in every culture. Our schools aren't any less secure than those in Europe, but yet we have a gun violence rate that is 20 times higher than uh, our partners in Europe. And the difference, if you really compare apples to apples uh, is the ease with which you can get a gun in the United States and the celebratory culture of gun violence. So um, we certainly draw upon experiences here to try to explain to our colleagues um, what levers we have to press and, 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 and what we don't. I just wanted to take this as one example of, uh, of where we see differences and, and, and want to overcome them together, of course. What we, we currently see, not much of a bright future of, of transatlantic leadership, if I may, what we see more a lack of it on, on very many fronts. The United States is about to start a fight that easily actually could turn into a fully-fledged trade war with the European Union and other players on the international stage. The, uh, European Union and the United States disagree on basically almost everything from uh, climate policy to how to deal with Iran uh, and let alone the North Korea question that the EU would probably never have escalated that far. Would you agree? Um, yes, of course, we have in general, of course, we are, we are seeing times, facing times where we have a, a when we have a, a disagreement which is not only a disagreement on certain topics but with regard to political approaches. Uh, it has been the talk here all the time that we appreciate and that we have appreciated uh, the, the principles of foreign post, American post-war foreign policy to be the steward, the leader of developing, establishing a, a system, an, an, a, a, a system of, of international relations which is rules-based a leadership of the, America, of, of the United States uh, for security, for cooperation and all that. So now we have a different approach and I think we have described it now quite often and now we have also to start the debate how to deal with that. And you mentioned different topics from North Korea to Iran. I think we have to separate the topics. They are differently. My appreciation or my view on uh, the United States dealing with the North Korean conflict is quite different, more positive, quite positive than the approach vis-a-vis -vis Iran. So we have to deal with the different topics and issues. And I think what we have to do is also to draw our conclusions. When we state that we have, in a way, a fundamentally different approach among governments, what is the conclusion for us who share uh, to be committed, dedicated to the international system as we have developed it, how can we cooperate? Are we, re are we only left to wait and see how this administration, how long it will live for more three years or for more seven years, or has fundamentally something changed we have to respond to? Uh, are the, the fabric of our societies feeling left behind vulnerable to globalization? What is our liberal answer to that? Only sticking to our narrative from the Cold War. So I think we have to do two things. We have to do some intellectual work. How, what is our response to make people feel better, better protected, better off in these shattering times of globalization? And the second thing is, I think we have to think in, in patterns of new alliances, not only between and among governments, but we have perhaps to forge uh, new alliances 
of the liberal camp. Um, not only relying on governments, but bringing in civil societies, different parties, politicians, businesses, in order to uphold another kind of transatlantic dialogue, conversation. Um, but isn't that, that happening already? In, but it, isn't it, that happening already? It's, it's happening this weekend. Like here. Like yeah. here, and this is my highest appreciation what GMF <laughs> is doing for that. But we have to broaden the conversation. We have to build up a kind of political approach among parliamentarians, <laughs> business people, for this liberal approach to the rational liberal approach to foreign policy uh, in order to, to not getting lost of, of, of this traditional approach and, may, and keep it alive. I'll actually come back to that very soon. Just one more question on, as you were talking about North Korea and the approach, uh, it will be hard for you to admit, but eventually uh, President Trump might even meet Kim Jong-un personally. Have you ever come to think that he might have, might have done the right thing? Well, it r remains to be seen. I think many of us have been rooting for a diplomatic solution uh, here. And I, and I have you know, given credit uh, to the Trump administration uh, with respect to you know, their work to try to bring China to the table, their understanding that uh, time was of the essence to ratchet up uh, economic and political pressure on the North Koreans. Um, but the you know, rather oddly fantastical way in which this ad hoc unplanned summit seems to be coming about um, could create more problems than it solves. And I think uh, we just have to be very honest about um, what could go wrong uh, if these two leaders get in a room without any sort of normal pre-planning uh, that would accompany, under normal circumstance, a substance, uh, a, a summit of this substance. Uh, the worry here is that um, if there is no deliverable on disarmament at this meeting, the uh, North Koreans may get everything that they want. They get a photo op um, that legitimizes uh, the Kim regime, uh, and they don't actually have to make any commitments on denuclearization. Uh, or, alternatively, uh, the meeting could go so badly that the president sours on, dis on diplomacy, uh, and you have a rush towards a military alternative that no one likes. Uh, so if this is not accompanied by some um, really serious pre-work, and right now it doesn't look like it's going to be, given the fact that Secretary Tillerson didn't know uh, that this summit was being planned uh, up until the announcement, uh, then there's some real downside danger to this. I, I just wanted to quickly build on something Norbert said because he's very right. I do think this, this issue of compartmentalization is, is, is very important because there are tensions that we can survive um, and there are others that we cannot. So on an issue like Iran, um, this is going to come to a head one yep. way or another yep. um, in the next several months. Yep. Um, and we have got to find a way to figure it out. On trade or on climate, um, not that we have time, not that there won't be some pretty awful bumps uh, through the withdrawal of Paris and a you know, potential escalatory set of, 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 of tariffs, but um, I, I think we can do some work um, behind the scenes uh, in an interparliamentary manner um, such that three years from now, we can pick back up TTIP negotiations, that we can re-enter Paris and, and, and make good on our commitments in time to make a difference. So I think you do have to compartmentalize because there are um, some problems that can, um, solutions that can still be there uh, three years from now yeah. and some solutions which will be gone. And Iran belongs to the letter. Uh, Iran, yeah, Iran belongs to the, the category in which yeah. um, we need to be doing some substantial work right now to make sure that um, we give the Trump administration whatever it feels it needs, and that is very hard to decipher right now in order to stay in the deal. Now, but Röttgen, what's your, you mentioned Iran, and you're, uh, you seem to be pretty much <coughs> on, the, on the same page here. Can you explain what you, the German government, and you personally are doing in, what, what in, in the approach that you just described, how to engage, how to bring other people in, and that would be just as a warning, or uh, not, not a warning for you, my yeah. last question before. Okay. I would like to open up uh, okay. the questions to you here in the audience, I and I'll walk around a little bit, so uh, just prepare a question, and prepare a question is what I'm uh, trying to say, uh, <laughs> usually defined by a question mark at the end. <laughs> Mr. Röntgen. I, thank you. <laughs> I consider Iran and our approach to Iran uh, to be perhaps the most divisive 
dangerous issue in the transatlantic relationship because we see really different approaches to the region in general and to Iran in particular. Uh, the American approach is trying to isolate Iran, trying to rally the Sunni Arab world against uh, Iran, uh, partly driven by economic business interests, in, in my opinion, and driven from the power calculus on the domestic uh, ground. The European perspective to that is that we are highly interested in more in creating stability in the region because this is our neighborhood region. And we have seen the refugee crisis as a crisis that has shattered us to the bones of our society. So what we need desperately is stability, not to mention peace. Our conviction is that without, not to mention against Iran, we will not see stability in the region. So we have to deal in a way with Iran and not to permanently attack Iran. So this, these are very different approaches, and, if, uh, and, if, and only the idea that, uh, that the United States could pull out of another agreement, the nuclear agreement with Iran, uh, would really put us in a, on opposite sides uh, in a geopolitical question, could perhaps also lead to another uh, entrance to a trade war, because this would be uh, this would uh, have uh, sanctions as a consequence. These sanctions would hit, again, European companies. So this has the potential to be a very toxic, uh, div div divisive, a dangerous issue in our relationships. And we have to, to really prepare that not going to happen. And listen, Europe's frustration is our frustration in the Congress on this issue. We do not know what the Trump administration needs from Congress and from our European partners in order to feel as if um, you know, some adjustments have been made sufficient for the president to continue to certify compliance with the deal uh, and stay in it. And, and we are desperate to hear more from the White House uh, so that we can figure out whether there are some commitments uh, that we can make uh, sufficient uh, to keep the deal in place. Yep. You said you don't know what what the White House needs. Are you sure that the White House doesn't, the White House doesn't know what it needs? Well, listen, I, I, I think the defining principle of the Trump administration is trying to ruin everything that Barack Obama did. And this is uh, the Obama administration's uh, primary and chief diplomatic legacy. Uh, and so I imagine that Donald Trump wakes up every day with uh, a desire to unwind it. Um, uh, and he promised to do so during the campaign. He has a lot of very smart people around him who tell him that is a terrible idea uh, and who thus far have been able to hold him to it. Um, but he also had a lot of smart people around him who told him that withdrawing from Paris was a terrible idea. Um, and he still did that. So I think you need to take this president at his word. Um, and he's been very clear about what his desire is on the Iran agreement. I agree that it's, as, it's, it's just as catastrophic for the relationship and for America's security, uh, as Norbert uh, uh, points out. Uh, but uh, the president has done more things than he s said he would than many predicted. I've uh, got a, a few questions. I'm looking for the microphones. Oh, here. One question was here, the lady. First one. I'll take three or four and then uh, do another round. I've seen it. Thank you, Zonia Wicket, Chatham House. I want to pick up something that uh, Norbert mentioned about the role of um, other actors than our governments, than our federal governments. And I would, I would like both you, both panelists, to talk a little bit, if you can, about um, how other actors might actually contribute to maintaining the transatlantic relationship, to moving forward um, the kind of liberal Western agenda, if that's what the objective is. Can you provide some concrete steps that they might do? And how do you get around uh, the challenge that these actors don't have legitimacy because they haven't been voted in? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Let's have another one here. I'm Jack Jaynes from Washington, D.C. I wanted to just direct a question to Norbert Rutkin. Um, recently in the Munich Security Conference, where we both were, you heard your then foreign minister say the following. When we Germans look across the Atlantic, we no, no longer recognize our America. You're only four feet from an American. 
I wonder if the problem was that the expectations or the visions that you want America to be uh, are no longer in sync with really what's going on over there. And I guess I would ask you, is that the case? And, and Senator Murphy, um, when you look at many of the concerns on this side of the ocean, it's all about, is this president an aberration? Or is this president something that's a representative of something more permanent that's going to be with us for some time to come? Thank you very much. Let's start with those two because I noticed that you don't have, uh, mm -hmm. you can't make any notes, so uh, I, won't, <laughs> I won't give you more than a couple questions at a time. Uh, please, and, and those two belong together anyways. I always consider this a huge mistake to confuse and conflate the country and the American people with the president. And I think we shouldn't do that. There is more. My second point is I think Trump is not a mere aberration. I think there are sources and forces which made him possible. And my personal analysis is that these sources and forces will endure and last over the presidency of Donald Trump. So they are there. But they are a kind of what we share in our Western democracies. Uh, that we have a sentiment against foreigners, refugees, that we are not really, have not found a recipe how to deal with, uh, with uh, a globalization and what makes people feel being insecure and not protected by the state. What is the state function? That we have a kind of retreat, uh, not only of the left behind, but also of wealthy people who do not commit to any kind of sharing responsibility within their societies. They have a kind of private liberal conviction, which means I want to live my private life and I do not want to see the state interfere uh, unless he does something which, which causes anger with me and then I'm getting very angry and, and I am vote for, I will have, I will, I will give a protest note to, to our political systems. This shows me that our Western democracies are in a transformative process and geopolitically that we have different answers to that. We have the rise of the authoritarian counter model in China, in Russia, in Turkey, and we have the rise of the populist, nationalist counter model within our societies. We have it in Europe. Orban, Kaczynski, major countries within the European Union diverting from the liberal model. Um, uh, we, and we have to face that. So we should see that we are, uh, that we are uh, in, that we share some common problems and challenges in our Western democracies, so that we should not only blame the one government, but we also have these problems in our societies. For the first time now in Germany, in the German parliament, we have at the third strongest party, a nationalist right-wing populist party for the first time in 70 years. So this gives evidence that also in Germany something has changed and is changing. We have Brexit, we have Macron in France, but we have at the cost of the destruction of the two traditional parties in France. We have the Italian election. I can't see how to build and how to build a government out of this election result. So we share some problems. And this is uh, what I mentioned and Insignia was re referring to. I think we have to take on the fight. Others are in action. The nationalists, the authoritarians have taken action. They are doing something. And we are sticking too much to the old patterns, to the old story, which is not completely true with regard to a completely shifted political landscape. We are talking about NATO. NATO is an institution of the Cold War. What is our adaptation for that? The transatlantic relationship, all the institutions we have, have been born and designed under the circumstances of the Cold War. So we have to develop, we have to give a sufficient liberal answer to the desires and feelings and sentiments of insecurity and so on of our people. And for that, I think we can't only rely on the governments because the governments are also the result of these insecurities and shifts in our societies. So we have to develop something differently. You have not been to be elected to have an opinion. You are a good example of that. Uh, there are strong convictions, strong views 
entrenched views in our societies, in our political systems, and we have, we have the threes. We have the, the private liberals, we have the authoritarians, uh, and I think we have to build up the camp of the traditional liberals, but we have to take action to do something, build new alliances within our societies and between our societies. Uh, so when, um, when I talk to uh, supporters of Trump in Connecticut, um, they tell me some variant of this. They say, listen, Chris, we know he's crazy, right? We knew he was crazy when we voted for him, but you're all crazy. You all have been ignoring right, the reality of our yeah. lives, uh, which yeah. is stagnant wages and inability yeah. to save for retirement, uh, uh, no clue about how to put our kids through college. Um, we see these massive forces overwhelming us, globalization, automation, and you have done nothing, nothing to try to protect us from that. And so we know that he is reckless, uh, but we feel like we have to disorient the status quo, and he's our best chance to do that. Um, and to the extent that the second most popular candidate in 2016 was Bernie Sanders, he remains the most popular Democrat in the United States today, is because Bernie was delivering those big solutions that Norbert's talking about, right? He got pilloried for suggesting that the United States should have free college, which sounded like a far out idea to you know, many intellectuals uh, in the beltway, and yet people flocked to it because it was a big idea that met the enormous financial challenges in their life. Um, I, I just, I, to this question of, of, of then how we sort of rebuild people's understanding uh, about the transatlantic uh, alliance, um, you know, I love something that Bernie did. I'll go back to Bernie. Bernie brought Ambassador Vittig to Vermont um, and had him travel around talking about um, how Germany addresses higher education and job training. Um, and it was a really innovative way um, to, um, to, to sort of bring a conversation about what works here, or at least works better, um, uh, into sort of an unfamiliar uh, conversation in the States. And so I think we've got to find some of these forums to bring European voices directly to Americans and bring American voices directly directly to Europeans rather than trying to explain each yeah. other yeah. through political voices. Yeah. Good idea. Thank you. We've got two more questions here, here and there. Dr. von Marshall uh, with the German Marshall Fund in Washington, D.C. Uh, we are in the third day of this forum, and I would like to ask the two of you, how do we come from analysis to action? What would your propositions where we start come Monday in, in doing something? Analysis is, of course, helpful, but now three days we are discussing why it is so difficult with this administration and why certain rhetorics makes it even more difficult to do something. But now is the question, which fields should we start to work on? What are the best options where we can achieve something, though it is difficult? Should we start on Monday to say, we have this tariff problem, now let's open again official talks about um, a trade agreement, and for this time, all tariffs are freezed, for example? Or should we finally on Monday start common strategy towards China? We are talking about that for 20 years, but it never happens. And um, what are your propositions? What are the one, two, three fields where you can, where you would say it makes sense to start because we can achieve something even under these circumstances. Is there something we could read in your newspaper on Monday, what you are going to propose? <laughs> yeah. yeah. If, if you give me... Uh, uh, okay. 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 Well, listen, I mean, I, we, we can't fix the, the problem of uh, the Trump administration's assault on transatlantic institutions and on multilateral institutions itself. Um, but as we were sort of hinting at before, um, as we try to weather some of these storms, there is important work that we can do under the surface. So um, yes, we are going to have to um, figure out a way to survive this uh, uh, announcement of whatever announcements are to follow on tariffs. But that doesn't mean um, that we can try to, that we can't try to do some work um, between businesses and between parliamentarians to 
get ready for a TTIP conversation that may spring forth uh, in the next administration. Uh, the private sector um, on both sides of the Atlantic can be um, ratcheting up their efforts on climate uh, to try to figure out ways to um, make some progress in the absence of the United States being in Paris. States and uh, governments, states in the United States who uh, have an independent commitment to climate can reach out and try to do some cooperative work here in Europe as well. So, um, listen, I don't think there's anything that, that we can do to try to automatically uh, address some of the inherent problems of this administration, but there is some other work we can do with civil society, with the private sector, some pre-work we can do to get ready for um, uh, 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 2020, 2021 that uh, may be helpful. Since, it, since foreign policy is not that much about legislation, and we, the both of us, are lawmakers, so we are not making foreign policy laws, uh, but what we can do is we can contribute and instigate, with the help of others, a transatlantic... Uh, uh, we, can, we can bring in our voices. Uh, we can instigate a debate. I would like to give one example, because some of us who are also here uh, from different parliaments, from the European Parliament, from the German Parliament, coming from different parties, uh, uh, publicized, published uh, the, our position on Nord Stream 2, which is a different position from the government I'm supporting. Then we got a response in this newspaper from others who are supportive of Nord Stream 2. But it was for the first time that crossing political borders and, 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 and comprising parliamentarians from different parliaments made their case for their different uh, positions. And this is something which we really need more to have off. It is, let, let's really start a debate on these strategic things. Do we want, we, we do not have a debate on Nord Stream 2 really in Germany. Do we want, is it in our strategic interest or not? We have to educate our citizens that this is of strategic importance. And bringing together different voices from the parliaments and from other sectors to make a strong public case for what we consider to be a, 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 an approach uh, which, which uh, uh, is responsible and feels responsibility for the future. I think this is something we, sh we should start. We, 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 we are living in historic times of unraveling, but I'm always really surprised that we have not an adequate debate, public debate, on the things which are going on. And I think our, a part of our responsibility as parliamentarians is to enter more strongly the public field of debating what is going on uh, in our societies and in our environments. Thank you very much. I'm getting signals that we're running out of time, uh, so I want to uh, slowly, slowly bring this to an end. I always hear uh, we need to wait for the next administration. Of course, we need to engage and say, uh, uh, you know, and, uh, and, and, and talk, but we need to wait for the next administration that doesn't seem very hopeful uh, that things will fundamentally change over the next three years. So, Senator, here's my question. You're uh, running again for Senate this year. Uh, are we, should we expect that you run for president in, in 2020? <laughs> uh, no, you should not expect that. Um, but but, but hopefully, hopefully you can expect that I'll be back in the Senate. And um, uh, with the 2018 elections may come a change in and of itself. And you may have a, a change in control of the uh, House, um, potentially in the Senate, um, and with that may come some opportunities uh, to force this administration to re-engage in some of these conversations. It's difficult for Congress to micromanage these questions of foreign policy, um, but next week um, we will actually have a vote in the United States Senate um, on the continued U.S. support for the Saudi-led bombing campaign in Yemen. Um, we are um, starting to try to um, engage 
engage more forcefully as a Congress in some of these um, major foreign policy questions where we think the administration has gotten it very badly wrong. And I, for one, think that this blank check that the administration has written to the Saudis is catastrophic for the United States. And there is a growing group of Republicans and Democrats who believe the same. Um, and so to the extent that that block gets bigger in 2018 uh, in these elections, uh, you may be able to uh, harmonize some of our policy, perhaps some of our foreign policy, uh, as Democrats in the Congress get stronger uh, and, and, and as we begin to find a way through potential new majorities uh, to smooth out some of these edges. So, um, no, there will have to be a decent amount of weight uh, but uh, the 2018 elections uh, may provide us a chance for a bit of healing. Norbert Röttgen, in Germany, you've just been re-elected chairman of the, uh, of the Foreign Affairs Committee. We've got a new government in place, hopefully, this week. Uh, but Next that week, also, yeah. hmm? Next week, yes. Uh, well, uh, yeah. Wednesday, sure. Uh, that is also uh, considered the last one of, of Angela Merkel. Uh, you criticized her for blurring a little bit the profile of the CDU and called for a change and also a generational change. Maybe should we expect you to run for uh, the, the post of the contender to, uh, to, to the, the heir to the throne, basically? Yeah. No, you, you, did not, you, you should not expect me to do that, but you should expect me to do my job as chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee, just being re-elected, re-appointed, re-elected for Parliament. And I'm very much looking forward to acting together with Chris. We have done so for in the several years past us, and we will do in the future. And we are, uh, we are determined uh, to make some change and a difference. To make the world a better place and the transatlantic relationship work again. Thank you very much both for being here, for, for discussing. Thank you. And thank you all for your question and your engagement. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Chief Diplomatic Correspondent for the New York Times, Mr. Stephen Erlanger. Um, hey. Hi, it's nice to see you. Good to see you, Brian. Hi. How are you? Uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you could um, decide whether you're staying or whether you're going and do it quickly, that would be great. Um, while while the set is being fixed, um, I just want to thank you. Could I have a bit of quiet in the room, please? Ladies and gentlemen, it's really rude, so please leave or stay, but don't talk, thanks. Um, I'm Steve Erlacher with the New York Times, and we have a really, really important session. We only have an hour, but it's Ukraine, it's Minsk, it's Georgia, it's EU accession, um, and it never gets quite enough at attention, so we're going to try to fix that today. So I would just ask my panels to come to the floor and, ar and arrange themselves as they've been instructed, not by me. Um, that's great. So in this new televisual kind of format, we're all going to supposed to walk around a bit. Um, and the intention is to try to give everyone a chance, particularly in the beginning, to have something to say. Um, so first, let me just welcome the panelists and briefly introduce them. First, in order, I suppose, of precedence is Georgi Margovashvili, the president of Georgia, since I think 2013. Um, and also very pleased to have Ivana Klimpush Tinsadze, who is uh, vice. Last names. No, that's well, it's it's the Georgian problem. That's yeah, yeah. that's why you're seated together. Got <laughs> it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the Georgian question. Um, she's a deputy vice premier of Ukraine and in charge of European integration and. And, and relations with the EU. <laughs> We're very honored to have um, Katrina Maternova, who's um, with the European Union's Department of Neighborhood and Enlargement. She's the Deputy Director General and deals quite a lot with these two issues. And very pleased to welcome an old friend, Kurt Volker, who is Executive Director of the McCain In Institute, first of all, but who's also, you may know, is a former ambassador of the United States to NATO and um, is currently volunteering um, quite selflessly 
to be um, America's special representative for the Ukraine negotiations. So welcome to you all. First, I just wanted to ask, um, Europe is having its own problems. It's pretty divided east-west. The appetite for enlargement seems very, very narrow. They're worried more about Poland and Italy these days, and now Slovakia, than they are about things further east. We talk about the Western Balkans as possibly the next candidates for um, membership. Georgia and Ukraine are lying out there. Everyone wants them to do well. The prospect of EU membership is important to them. It also helps them, I think, adjust their societies. It gives them a good excuse, a good pretext for doing things many people in those countries know need to be done. So I just wanted to ask, first of all, the president of Georgia and then Ivana, given this setting, do, what are your expectations for actual candidacy, let alone accession to the EU in the next five years? Well, and, and feel free to wander. <laughs> <laughs> there are issues that I'm pretty stable and I can... I okay, can you said that. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm clear on this. Well, we, we, are, uh, we are applying to EU, to NATO, and we believe we deserve to become members, and we think that we are entitled to become members. And in a way, let me tell you the Georgian perspective, like, or... or maybe probably also Ukrainian or Moldovan perspective of how, how people feel about this, you know? I mean, we've been in this process for, since the collapse of Soviet Union, but I would say uh, earlier than that. We, uh, I mean, my generation, the generation that is active, becoming even more active right now, comes from the period of the Cold War and comes from the period of Soviet Union. And since the collapse of the Cold War, we viewed ourselves, people who were confronting the system, societies that were confronting the system, we viewed ourselves as, in a way, the, the ones that really made the battle, battle mm -hmm. to dismantle the system, mm -hmm. which we believed was inadequate and was but, harming. But are people paying enough attention to what you're doing? Well, that I'm, I'm telling that what we were doing and what the society was doing during the Soviet Union. It was called the Cold War, but people of uh, Eastern Europe, people uh, of independent nations of Soviet Union, we stood really hard to dismantle the system. And we believe that we were in this process after the collapse of Soviet Union, fighting for our Western values, fighting for yeah. our independence, and we've been harmed pretty badly. Georgia, Ukraine, Moldova. And this, this is a process where our societies have to pay for our Western choice. Mm -hmm. And they have to pay, in many cases, they have to pay not only prosperity, but also their lives but for their choice. Are, and are people cognizant enough of the payment, and are they paying enough attention? Well, Let's not go back they, to the Soviet Union days. By, in some cases, they are bombarded by Russian altruism, and so they are more than cognizant what what is happening. Yes. So in this respect, we believe that we committed to these values. We have mm -hmm. committed our reforms, but not only reforms, mm -hmm. our natural choice to these values. And are we happy with the tempo? No, we are not. Are we faithful to this decision? Yes, we are. Very and good. we stick with these values and we stick with this choice. Thank you. But at the same time, we don't no. think that it's happening fast enough. Okay. Madam Klimpush, what do you say? Well, we understand that Europe has a lot of challenges and your Atlantic community has a lot of challenges that you have to meet. Uh, at the same time, we believe back in Ukraine that our transition and our every single uh, positive change that we are achieving, uh, every success that we are enjoying, are actually success that is first and foremost important for us, but it's also important for our, our friends, because it gives you another breath. It gives you um, a reminder, and I think it's a very much needed reminder, that there is, that there used to be, and there still is this positive power um, of your Atlantic community, European community, uh, transatlantic community, that, that is, 
providing is helping um, uh, with an effort for a meaningful and positive change. And that's important. And so with this in mind, we are transitioning our countries. We are changing our countries. We are making our effort, as, as uh, President of Georgia is saying as well, we are doing this in Ukraine. But no, we are not hearing the appreciation uh, uh, to the extent or the, the acceptance of our mm. choice to the extent as, as we would like to see it. Right. We are realists and we understand that right now we probably have to focus on our bilateral tracks in terms of association mm -hmm. agreements implementation, in terms of uh, ANP implementation for, for NATO part, that we have to work on all of this huge and ambitious mm. tasks that we've set for ourselves. Yes. But, and also right. be creative about different mechanisms that we can mm. come up with, like uh, 28 plus three with the EU and three countries, Georgia, mm. Moldova and yeah. Ukraine, or yes. European uh, or Eastern Partnership Plus. And we'll come back to this, but I mean, you also have work to do at home, right? I mean, because yes, we have there is do. a feeling that domestic reform is not going fast enough to meet European standards. So with this, let's ask Katerina, this is your job. How are they doing? These two countries are doing very well. Walk. President <laughs> of Sakhar Tvelo, Ivanka from Ukraine. Um, you asked a difficult question, but I have a very sort of practical and pragmatic answer. I want to say that European Union and Georgia and Ukraine have never been closer. Mm -hmm. We are not each other's foreigners anymore. And uh, while the process of European integration is not happening to the liking of either of the two countries with the tempo. I think you specifically, Mr. President, spoke about the tempo mm -hmm. of, uh, of integration. It is happening. There is a lot of uh, support given both politically and uh, in terms of financial and concrete support. We are in a room where five years ago, if anyone asked whether the European Union would stand united mm -hmm. on sanctions against Russia, nobody would believe that, including me. Mm -hmm. This was unimaginable five years mm -hmm. ago. Mm -hmm. And we are where we are, mm -hmm. so I think there is tremendous support. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's not to the likings of some of us who work on it, mm -hmm. but I think we have uh, come a long way. Mm -hmm. And I'm delighted that on a Saturday morning, we actually get a full room, uh, a full great. room That's right. in, in it's Brussels, terrific. because I think that with all the, and, mm -hmm. and you spoke uh, yourselves about uh, the challenges the EU has with all these serious, serial crises that we've been going through, migration, mm -hmm. financial matters, um, the attention to the East is, is, is not mm -hmm. as high mm -hmm. as it was some time ago, mm -hmm. but uh, the support is mm -hmm. steady, and I'm delighted that we are getting a community mm -hmm of thinkers like this uh, actually focused on uh, these two countries. Who's doing better? Between the two? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a difficult question. <laughs> well, it's easier to, uh, for a smaller country to, 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 to harness, uh, harness uh, right. uh, reforms with, uh, with the, the previous government, the current <laughs> government. Fair but enough. I would like to say that uh, the amount of reforms and the delta between the situation in Ukraine in 2014 mm -hmm. and now is really extraordinary. Mm -hmm. and, and that actually the image that Ukraine has is not fair. Mm -hmm. And the, 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 the view that, that uh, it's slowing down reforms, I always ask myself, compared to what? Yeah. OK. Very, very good. And don't forget mm. about the hot war that is being fought well, I was every just single day. Coming to that, in fact. So. But that's um, just against the, the no, 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 of, course. of this war. I mean, in fact, happening. I have in front of me one of the latest OSCE special monitoring reports from the conflict in Ukraine, the east of Ukraine. And just it's worth getting because it's worth supporting the OSCE in this very good work that it's doing. And just to give you a flavor of it, we recorded fewer ceasefire violations in both Donetsk and Luhansk regions compared to the previous reporting position. But that included 19 explosions compared to 42 explosions the day before, et cetera, et cetera. It's, a, it's quite an extraordinary document. And just to remind you, it, we're now in the fifth year of this conflict. 
About 11,000 people have died, most of whose deaths have not been recorded by outside Ukrainian or Russian media. Um, it is a hot war, much as you said, and um, it is one of the reasons that I think the EU is reluctant because in general EU and NATO, and we can talk about that, do not tend to accept countries with boundary disputes that are going on, right? And in Georgia, you, didn't, you have one, you have two going on, basically, with well, South Ossetia and Abkhazia. The EU and NATO don't accept it. It, it depends right. what is the time, because Fair there enough. were cases where, where NATO was joined mm -hmm. by countries with the major disputes. So That's fair <laughs> enough. But, I mean, the, the point is it leads to a kind of uncertainty. So here I'd like to bring in Kurt, Kurt Volker and give him a chance to talk a bit about what he's trying to, to do. Kurt is trying to deal with Minsk, you're in negotiations with Surkov from Russia, but at the same time, the United States is not a party to Minsk, and it's not a party to the Normandy group. So one of the things I just want to ask you, is this a mistake? Should somehow we renegotiate Minsk or try to deal with it differently mm. to move it along? Anyway, Kurt. All right, well, Steve, thank you very much for, for the introduction, and thank you, Karen Donfried, Ian Lesser, for inviting me here to the Brussels Forum, so this is great. To start with your question, I would say we have the Minsk Agreement already. It has in it all of the things that need to happen, starting with a ceasefire, ending with a return of the international border to Ukrainian control and full Ukrainian sovereignty and territorial integrity. So it's all in there. So the problem is not the agreement. The problem is the will to implement it. And here's what we've gotten to is we have um, Russia as a signatory of the Minsk agreements with Ukraine and the OSCE, but we've never had a lasting ceasefire. We have Russian command and control of the forces there, Russian direction of the two entities there, the Luhansk and Donetsk People's Republics. We've not had the withdrawal of heavy weapons. And as a result, what you read, the SMM report happens every day. Every day. Every day. There are ceasefire violations, there are bombings, there are sniper attacks. On average, Ukraine loses a couple of soldiers a week. Imagine anyone here from any country that you have a hot war on your territory, not somewhere far away, on your national territory, and you have your armed forces defending your country, and you are losing a couple soldiers a week defending your own territory on your own country. That's the situation that Ukraine is in. Imagine the impact on the politics of your country from something like that. What would people be talking about? Imagine the ability to grapple with the necessary normal issues that governments have to deal with, you know, education, growth, uh, reform, development, so on, when you're dealing with this problem. So that's the, the pressure cooker that Ukraine is in. Let me address your earlier question too, because you brought up some big questions about enlargement. Because I think that's the wrong way to raise the issue. You don't start from the perspective of enlargement or not enlargement, and then start checking, you know, are we there or are we not there? We start from the perspective of values, uh, that we believe in our societies in key values that need to be respected. Uh, freedom, democracy, respect, economic opportunity, human dignity, human rights, rule of law, security. Mm -hmm. These are what we care about. These are what we want in our own societies. These are what Ukrainians want. These are what Georgians want. These are what Moldovans want. Um, this is what everybody throughout Europe wants. It's what we would want to see in Russia. We, we want the best for the Russian mm -hmm. people. And that's what we no, want to see there fine, as well. But, but if we don't have it there, it is on us to figure out how to strengthen these values, reinforce, mm -hmm. assist, provide security uh, so that everyone is better off. Mm -hmm. And if you do that, enlargement can be a consequence of that. Mm -hmm. But that's not the place where you start in terms of talking about enlargement. You talk about what we're trying to achieve. And that's why okay. we are so engaged in trying to build peace uh, in Ukraine. How are you doing on getting a UN peacekeeping force? Uh, that the UN peacekeeping force idea is meant to be a transition mechanism. Mm -hmm. So that if you have um, Russian forces controlling eastern mm -hmm. Ukraine now, the end state needs to be a restoration of Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial mm -hmm. integrity under Ukraine's constitutional government. Mm -hmm. In between, a UN peacekeeping force could provide a secure space. 
It could allow the conditions for implementation of the Minsk agreements, elections, special status, mm -hmm. amnesty. And it could allow for security to really take hold before you see the territory restored to Ukraine. We've put this proposal together, mm -hmm. together with the Normandy partners, France and Germany. Mm -hmm. We have built a lot of support within EU countries, NATO mm -hmm. countries, potential troop contributing countries. Uh, it is in Russia's hands now. We, mm -hmm. we have presented this to Russia. When was your last conversation with Russia? In January. January. And Russia, we, we, we talked about this in some detail. Um, they said at the time, some of these ideas are constructive, we'd like to work with them, we will come back to you with a proposal mm -hmm. that talks about the mandate to the force, the geographic extent, and the timeline mm -hmm. over which it would deploy. Mm -hmm. And key for anyone is that we have a real, proper peacekeeping force that covers the territory, has, is on the border with Russia, and has containment of heavy weapons, because that's how you create the conditions mm -hmm. where you can really have electoral campaigns, okay. candidates, rallies, and so forth. Great. Now, just to keep you yeah. occupied, um, I've asked the group here to put together some questions that you might vote on. So if you can get out your devices, I think we call them devices, your smartphones. Um, I'm looking for question number one. Um, and I'll just read it to you. It's very simple. In your opinion, you're all very smart people. You follow these things. Is the mince process working? Yes, no, or give it more time. So while you think about that and ideally vote, I just want to ask Kurt and also Ivana, do you think, as you talk to the Russians, it's in their interest at all to calm down the situation in eastern Ukraine? Is it better for them to have Ukraine preoccupied with this? Or are they feeling the pressure of settling something because it costs them also? So I'm just curious what you think, both of you. Mm -hmm. um, you have already the answer to the question um, by the audience. Yeah. Well, um, I think it's clear then, people. <laughs> but people still have a degree of patience. So go ahead. Well, I'm pretty skeptical about the readiness of Russian Federation to actually deliver on Minsk or on, on any readiness of Russian Federation to, to get to a solution. And, uh, but that doesn't mean that we in Ukraine would not exploit every single opportunity to try to reach the solution by diplomatic means, by political means. And we understand very well that uh, it won't be this conflict won't be, won't be resolved by, by weapons. At the same time, we also believe that you know, the, the uh, condemnation of Russian Federation by the West also has to be kind of underwritten by the, their readiness to, to support Ukraine mm -hmm. and to, uh, to actually provide Ukraine with knowledge, with tools, with trainings, mm -hmm. because if this war is not resolved by the weapons, without weapons and without mm -hmm. training, it can, uh, it can be lost. Do and we have to mm -hmm. understand this. And, and let me mm -hmm. just uh, yeah, no, please. continue on. I think when you stand up, they allow you to talk No, longer. that's good. Walk around. <laughs> right. um, <laughs> um, I figured that. Um, so, uh, <laughs> so that's one thing. Uh, so I'm skeptical about <laughs> Russian Federation uh, and, and their willingness to, to deliver. And I think it's also very important that the sober understanding of Russian Federation would uh, be spread in the West. Just the latest, what they've done with, the, with their blackmailing after, their, uh, after they lost the uh, Stockholm uh, arbitrage, mm -hmm. blackmailing of Ukraine, and thus uh, actually showing exactly to the whole world what exactly they are up to. Mm -hmm. And I think that all these lessons have to be drawn from Russian behavior. Mm -hmm. And we have to understand that this is what we are standing up and against mm -hmm. of. And we have to understand that we are not only standing up against the hard, uh, hard war uh, of Russia mm -hmm. and hard and hot war of Russia mm -hmm. against Ukraine, mm -hmm. but it's also a soft war against the West. Right. And who doesn't right. see, see that, mm -hmm. uh, so you are not watching closely enough. So in a way, you've, you feel like you're stopping the Turks at, at Vienna, right? That's your job. We know we are eastern <laughs> right. flank of right. NATO. We right. do know that. And we are allowing 
NATO to can kind of decide what and how you would deter further mm. Russia okay. and how you would defend yourself. And I think that that's already our input to the, to the security mm -hmm. of the region mm -hmm. and to the security and stability of the world. Can I ask you just one more thing? Would, do, you, do you think Ukraine really is prepared to have a popular vote in eastern Ukraine about self-government or is this just inconceivable? At this particular point, when we don't have any move on, on having continuous ceasefire for seven days that would envisage at least withdrawing of the heavy weapons uh, from, from these pilot regions of uh, pilot uh, focal points where we've decided to do that, agreed to do that, I don't think that any discussion uh, about the vote Okay. in the territories okay. would be feasible in the okay. Ukrainian society. Okay. Thank you. Kurt, what's your sense of what the Russians want or and what, what is pushing them to talk even now? I think um, we have to separate the issue of solving the, uh, the conflict, getting Russian forces out of eastern Ukraine from the idea that Russia is somehow going to be a, a more natural, positive, cooperative partner. Um, I think what we have is a Russia that wants to see a pro-Russian government in Ukraine. They, they want to restore what they consider to be a normal situation, and they view Madam Clinton Bush's government as abnormal. Uh, so that's what I think they want. By invading and occupying and claiming to annex Crimea and, and still occupying eastern Ukraine as well, uh, they've produced the opposite. They've produced a more unified, more nationalist, more Western-oriented, more anti-Russian Ukraine than has ever existed before. And that deepens every day. And the, the younger generation of Ukrainians is completely lost to Russia now. They, they see them as aggressors and occupiers. So if Russia wants to pursue its objectives of trying to influence Ukraine and bring, pull Ukraine closer to Russia. It's got to start by getting out of eastern Ukraine. Okay. Sir, yes, please. Uh, let me just uh, uh, comment. Till we try to break down issues separately, Russia-Ukrainian conflict, Russia-Georgia conflict, <laughs> Russia-Moldova <laughs> problems, Till we, till we break those issues down and don't want to see or are not bold enough to see the, jo the whole picture, I think we are losing the, the, the general understanding mm -hmm. of Russian policy. Plus, if we don't want to listen to Russians, if we don't want to hear uh, Putin's speeches, I think we, we, are, we, are, we are not putting the right question. I mean, Russia, what are Russian intentions? What is Russian policy? Does that have to be guessed? You don't need uh, special intelligence for that. Russians are very well outspoken, and in many sense, they are very sincere. So what we what heard- What are we not hearing? I have to stand up, yeah? Oh, no, no. <laughs> so what, oh, I mean, so what we heard yeah. recently, so what we heard recently <laughs> was outspoken stand policy of fight. Russian Federation, yeah. and it was a policy of renewing the Cold War. And we've seen Russians being sincere in 2007, before Georgian war, we've been them sincere afterwards. So what Russia plans with its near neighborhood is to be a policing force and force that reacts to any kind of possibility to enter as with a military solution and with military arms. Now, if we accept that, mm -hmm. if, we if we believe what the highest government officials of Russia say, and they are sincere, then we have to craft policy not to Ukraine, not mm -hmm. to Georgia, not to Moldova, but we have to craft a joint policy. And going back to the values, are we sincere in the values that we declare? Mm -hmm. when, the, when, when there are the declarations of saying that US or the West will support any effort of an independent nation which tries to be a peacekeeping nation, mm -hmm. deciding to live in peace with its neighbors. Those are the values that we bought in, mm -hmm. including when we were in Soviet Union or afterwards when we were building our independence. Okay. If, just, let me, just let me finish. Okay. So if we are bold enough, first of all, 
to face the Russian policy and not try to break it down to separate cases. And if we are bold enough to stand behind our values, I think that we should be talking about crafting a much more realistic attitude towards Russia, which I believe is bringing more peace, not only to Georgia, Ukraine, and Moldova. Okay. It is building more stability. It is bringing more stability to Russia. So we are yeah. entering an era of okay. an attempt of okay. a Cold okay. War. I got it. I mean, it's fine. I mean, you've really made your point. Now, so let me okay. press you for a, a moment, both of you, on this question of values. Because one of the things that's happening in, in um, Ukraine, and it's happened in Georgia too, is the government has basically tried to de russify Ukrainian language, legal systems, culture. How do we know that you will protect minority rights, including Russian speaking minority rights, in the future? That's part of values, too. And there are lots the of right doubts we about have not it. Now, Ivana, why don't you try to answer first? Um, first, just one sentence about the previous question. Russia's motto is destabilization and division, and their goal is world of chaos where they would be ruling. And that's from where we have to understand Russian okay. Federation. With regard to what we want in Ukraine and what we are trying to build and what we've been doing all this time with two revolutions, with our uh, extremely uh, powerful race of the, of the civil society, with the sacrifice of people uh, that, that is being done every single day, it's that we were trying and we are still trying to build a better nation. And we want to build the state that would actually serve, the political system that would actually listen, and the economy that would um, reward talent over, over connections. And yes, with freedom, with democracy, with uh, rights of every single citizen, including of, uh, national, of those of national minorities to be preserved. Okay. I am a Kievite who have, uh, I was born, raised in Kiev. When I went to Ukrainian school during the Soviet times, and I'm pretty mature. Uh, <laughs> uh, so when I went to school... I'm more mature uh, than you. <laughs> to the, to the <laughs> Ukrainian school in Kiev, in the center of Kiev, back in the uh, 80s. Um, at that point, I was Ukrainian school, Ukrainian speaking school. I was among maybe five, six kids in the class who was coming from the Ukrainian speaking family because it was not modern. It was not... Um, right. Mm, good to speak Ukrainian mm -hmm. because you were, were kind of a village person if you mm -hmm. were not right. speaking Russian. But we did. We decided that we preserve our Ukrainian identity. And, uh, what, 25, 30 years later, my kids of both Ukrainian and Georgian origin, mm -hmm. for that mm -hmm. matter, speaking Ukrainian and Georgian at school, at, at home, mm -hmm. coming to Ukrainian school in the center of Kiev, and are again among the minority, among the five, six, children in their classes, mm -hmm. each of them, uh, that speak Ukrainian. Mm -hmm. So I think we really have to still work on preserving the okay. Ukrainian majority in Ukraine mm -hmm. and work on and allowing us to actually fulfill our rights to become a political nation, mm -hmm. political nation, mm -hmm. with respect to every single minority, okay. but also with understanding who we are as mm -hmm. a nation mm -hmm. that have, uh, is rooted mm -hmm. on okay. that land. Katarina, do you find that convincing? About, about protecting m minority rights, or is this a big issue? Well, I certainly agree that protecting minority rights is uh, one of the core values mm -hmm. of being European, absolutely. But I think that the law that uh, created such, a, such an excitement uh, in, the, in the news was actually not a law trying to de-Russify Ukrainian education system. It was a law to de-Sovietize Ukrainian education system. Mm -hmm. The minority uh, language issue was just one small portion of a much broader reform, a fundamental reform to reform the education for, for, uh, for Ukrainian kids. And I think that was perhaps, it's one of these issues that was a little bit blown out of proportion because I think that the law, and there, are, there is a Venice Commission uh, recommendation, is actually looking at and, and, and protecting minority languages. Okay. 
All right, good. I mean, one of the things that I, I'm not going to actually ask you to pull out your machines and vote again. Um, this is actually um, on question five. Um, given the conflicts with Russia, given uh, the importance you've put on um, NATO, I just wanted to ask all of you. I was at Bucharest in the famous That's Bucharest right. summit when Putin crashed the dinner and warned President Bush not to go into Georgia and Ukraine, where we had this strange compromise, right? Which mm -hmm. was promise of membership sometime, somewhere, over the rainbow, right? But a promise. So the question I have for all of you is, do Georgia and Ukraine have a realistic chance of becoming NATO members in the next 20 years? Yes or no? So I'd be very curious just to, just to get your views. Um, how important, while people are, 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 are voting, Ms. Brady, how important is it, or is, or, or is this map process, this preparation process, is it good enough for, good enough for now? Or, well, I think or have, is there resentment? Well, as I'm, I'm trying to, to, to build my argument is that we, had, we have to be adequate to the reality. And the reality, I believe, is following that we are seeing more and more aggressive Rus Russian policy in the neighborhood, and we are seeing an attempt, an attempt of, of, uh, of Russia to build and imitate a, a new Cold War, which doesn't have its backgrounds in economics, it doesn't have its reasoning with the military solution, but it has its political emotion within itself. Mm -hmm. So we are seeing more and more of that rhetoric. So I think what we should be doing, and I'm not talking about Georgia and bounty for Georgia with EU or NATO, but I'm talking about the European security and the Euro-Atlantic security, which includes Georgia and Ukraine as a stable, as, as a, for the sta most stable Europe. And in this respect, I think we should be rushing with both of solutions, because if we think of the Cold War, the Cold War are the proxy wars, and the proxy wars are happening in the questionable uh, in, in the spaces which have to be decided which way they go. So Georgia, Ukraine, and Moldova, they are all on, on the stake right now, and I think we should be rushing with all the solutions if we were realistic and if we were listening to Russians, which once again are very sincere. Okay, thank you. The audience is a bit depressed about the prospect, but <laughs> let's, uh, Ivana, what let's do you make think? Let's sure that okay. we are invited here 20 years from now okay. by the German Marshall Fund and we'll, we'll kind of uh, see what, was hap what happened over this time, mm -hmm. over this period of time. But um, you know what? I think in this world that today is kind of scared, sometimes lost, sometimes pretty much deceived by the Russian Federation. The, there are two ways of actually ensuring your um, uh, security, viable security. One is uh, getting ready to defend yourself and doing everything to defend yourself. And second one, getting ready to defend yourself and become a NATO member. And that's from where we are coming. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that there's, there will be sooner or later that time when the, the um, NATO members would have to come down to that commitment of the Bucharest uh, declaration, uh, summit declaration of 2008 that Ukraine and Georgia will become NATO members because they will understand there will be an awareness, a deep and, and clear awareness mm -hmm. that these countries are actually not uh, destabilizing their system, but actually bringing upon uh, this stability mm -hmm. positive, positive uh, influence. And, uh, and, and we have to remember what we want and what we are asking for. It's nothing more than any of our Central and Eastern European mm -hmm. uh, neighbors have been asking over this, uh, these times. And I think that we should not be denied that because Russian Federation doesn't want us so. Yes. Well, I mean, so, so precise, and we yeah, okay. we do mm -hmm. want to to become part of European family. We are doing everything mm -hmm. on on our side to actually be entitled to that to, to that in, in terms of compatibility and eco economic okay. uh, ability. But. Um, we don't want to become the zone or to remain the so-called zone of interest of the That's Russian right. Federation. That's right. And 
an, yet another borderland, yeah. right? Steve, yes, please. Can I, can I jump in on this? Because I want to give the audience choo, choo, maybe choo. a okay. little perspective. <laughs> right. 20 years the other direction, mm -hmm. the EU was 15 members, NATO was 16 members, we were dealing with Boris Yeltsin and Kozarev in mm -hmm. the Kremlin, and, and this thing didn't exist. <laughs> uh, so a lot Those can happen in 20 years. didn't last very long, I know. Yeah, a lot can happen <laughs> in 20 years. That's right. And that's why I come back yeah. to the point on values again. We have to be steady and knowing who we are, and that can shape the environment we're going to be in. Very good. Now, I'm going to come, we've got about 15, maybe 20 minutes left. Um, last year, the European <laughs> Union withheld 600 million euros from Ukraine because it was not happy with reform progress. The EU is planning, I gather, another 1 billion euros in aid if Ukraine does set up a truly independent anti-corruption court and um, raises gas prices, which is a whole other complicated topic we don't have time to get into. The EU doesn't ask us to raise the gas prices. Okay, it's fine. the IMF. So, okay, thank you. <laughs> but it, they are dependent it on their decision. It, it seemed odd, because, I mean, let's not get into Nord Stream. <laughs> that's, that's, that's too much for now. But you have, in a way, when I, I've been to Ukraine, I think there are two ideas of corruption, right? For the Europeans, it's kind of graft, right? You have oligarch corruption. You have a president who you don't have to comment, but in my view is kind of 30% president and 70% oligarch, um, but is, you know, you have a prime minister who's working very you, hard. In which country, you mean? In Ukraine. That's my point of view. I don't expect yeah. you to agree with it, um, but it is I widely shared. I comment. I am no, 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 it's fine. I mean, official. You'll have time in, in a second. So what is the biggest issue with this anti-corruption court? Why is it being resisted so fiercely <laughs> when it is so clearly important to aid and to your reputation with the EU and Washington? I'm just, tell us. Well, first and foremost, um, okay. Anti-corruption <laughs> is not, <laughs> right. it's not exclusively um, only about, um, you know, putting people behind the bars mm -hmm. in jail. Mm -hmm. uh, it's about much more. And I think the track record in that direction of Ukraine over this year, so this four years, is really impressive. And we can count of, of, on many different reforms that we've done starting from the clearing up of the banking system, uh, you know, closing the, the um, drains in the, in the uh, energy sector, mm -hmm. making Naftogaz the biggest taxpayer in, in Ukraine, uh, introducing the Prozoro system of public procurement, which is uh, electronic, which is um, uh, clear, transparent, understandable to everyone. So um, all of these things are actually closing the loops of, uh, of corruption in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. But, and yes, during this time, all of these reforms that we have drafted, passed, and implemented over this time, uh, they were targeting and building a lot of new institutions. And these institutions are, uh, we, we've, we've, we've set up them from the scratch. And yes, in order to actually finish the, this circle, or kind of round this circle with a serious dot, we have to still uh, focus on the judiciary system. Mm -hmm. And that's where we have, I think, I personally believe, since my dime, I personally believe that that's the biggest, the, the weakest link we have in Ukraine. And once we are fixing, and once we've fixed the, the judiciary and the courts, mm -hmm. then we are, we are fine with, with everything, with, with business environment, with the rule of law, with the protection of rights, with, with every single thing. So we need a, a uh, cleaned up judiciary. Mm -hmm. Um, that's why we started and we already mm -hmm. appointed the new Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. And yes, maybe for the, for the speeding up of the process, we need the anti-corruption court. <laughs> and we already agreed that we do uh, need the anti-corruption court. Why there is a resistance? There is a resistance because people do not want to get to jail. They know that they... Um, <laughs> yeah. that Fair they, enough. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that there are some, some sins behind yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. Uh, there are some on, powerful on people who... On different yeah. levels. Right. But at the same time, 
you have to understand that there is a commitment to actually mm -hmm. deliver upon that. For this example, was, government mm -hmm. has actually put money already at the, uh, at the end of the last year for the functioning mm -hmm. of the anti-corruption mm -hmm. court for this year. Mm -hmm. So as soon as the f parliament would find the will to vote, the government is already ready to implement and we can go to the next stage. But again, don't forget, it takes time. Right. And okay. we, we need that okay. time and we need some, some credit for what we've been doing. Mm -hmm. And also we need engagement going along this way, difficult way that we are going uh, through from our partners and not to look for any opportunity to shy away to, uh, uh, from and the not, And not always to accept the kind of Russian argument that Ukraine is hopeless, I suppose you would say, too, right? Uh, and Ukraine is not corrupt as okay. well. It's an okay. uh, over, over simplification. Okay. Thank you. Katerina, um, how is Ukraine doing on, on this metric? Well, first I mean, of all, I think that the uh, Russian narrative is very clear. Ukraine mm -hmm. is so hopelessly corrupt mm -hmm. that it's practically a failed state. Mm -hmm. And whenever I speak about Ukraine in various audiences, I always ask, you know, those who think the glass is half full, raise your hands, and invariably, the glass is half empty in mm -hmm. public perception, at least, in, at least in Europe. And I strongly disagree with this view. I actually think, and I'm delighted that the narrative <coughs> is being picked up by mm -hmm. the Ukrainian government, that a lot has happened specifically on anti-corruption. And... And I see my co-professor uh, Svetlana in the audience. We just had a class on this where we were discussing strength of institutions. And in an institutionally weak environment, which every transition country is, mm -hmm. it's much safer to fight corruption before it occurs. <coughs> For example, by letting the hrivna fall, you eliminated the arbitrage and the, and the fabulous riches of a lot of the oligarchs that manipulated the fixed exchange rate. And just to mention one example, you spoke about Naftogaz. When the Grossman government came into power in the spring of 2016, it br brought the gas tariffs to import parity level and overnight eliminated the biggest corruption that occurred. And Naftogaz, the state monopoly, had uh, $8 billion loss two years ago and $1 billion profit last year. Okay. And the delta of nine billion does not come from efficiency gains. Right, exactly. Now, am There's I saying? There's been some more double, g double but, glazing. Yeah, of but windows, am I saying? You know? <laughs> am I saying that Ukraine uh, is not corrupt and still no. has right. lots to uh, lots to reform? Absolutely. Fair enough. But the the anti-corruption court was adopted already in the first reading okay. last week. Right. Hopefully, it will be uh, adopted because it is our our condition as well okay. as the IMFs. And the last point, uh, you mentioned 600 million euro that was lost, which mm -hmm. indeed is the case because of the governance concerns. But it's not only, we actually on a yearly basis give about quarter billion euros mm -hmm. on a continuous basis mm -hmm. to Ukraine and uh, lots of reforms, support lots of reforms and, uh, and invest in the economy. Okay. Great. So I'm going to, we've got maybe eight minutes or something, and I'd like to take a couple questions. So um, people think of questions, but first I'm going to ask you to vote one more time. This is question three, question three, which is on the scale of corruption, ladies and gentlemen. Is Ukraine's government, one, irredeemably corrupt, two, tolerably corrupt, or three, unfairly judged to be corrupt? So get out your devices and Just vote. Just one comment. I want Please. To during, the, during this vote, you know, okay. uh, and I think it surfaced out during this discussion. There are real issues with any nation, be it Ukraine, be it Georgia, any nation, the United States. But we should always be aware, while discussing those issues, that we are also living in an era of propaganda where Russia is very powerful. This should, we should always be aware of the way we put the questions and the way we discuss them. We should be aware that the Russian propaganda has been proved not by Georgians or Ukrainians, Ukrainians but it has been proved by our Western allies that it is a factor. So we should move. No, absolutely. I think that's 
um, that's a very well taken point, and you have more work to do, as you can see, at least in this group. Some questions, I see Natalie Nugared, so Natalie, and... Um, is, it, is, is it not on? It, uh, is, is there one that's... I mean, maybe you can talk into this then. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just talk. Just talk. Uh, okay. Steve, I love you, but I'm not going to do that. Um, <laughs> We're just running out of time, so go ahead. Kurt, um, you are, unless I'm mistaken, you are the only representative of the Bush, of the Trump, Trump, Trump administration in this conference. So, so thank you for being here. The title of this session is Euro-Atlantic Integration. What, what? What, what's forward, what's happening. The, 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 this week, we have seen uh, the Trump administration launch what seems to be an assault on uh, the EU through its trade policies. I think we cannot uh, you know, sidestep this question as we're discussing Euro-Atlantic integration. And it matters to countries like Ukraine because the way the EU is approached by America today, the way it is treated, the way it is supported or not supported, has an impact on what the EU can do towards its neighborhood, right? And I suppose um, my question also uh, is, is addressed to our, our friend from, from, from the EU. Um, my, my question is, you know, uh, what is the, Bush, the Trump administration's policy on Russia in terms of how it works or doesn't work or, you know, uh, uh, with the EU? Keeping the EU, okay. um, I mean, you know, functioning and supported mm -hmm. by America matters in the way we deal with, with Russia. So that was my question. Great. Thank you. Do you want to, other of you? Just sure, I'll just say, uh, first of all, my, my remit is the Ukraine negotiations, not trade. Uh, in dealing with Russia and in addressing the, uh, the war in Ukraine, uh, I am very conscientious to work with our German and French uh, partners who have developed the Normandy process and who lead that. Uh, also with the Canadians and the Norwegians and others who have important interest there, the Brits but also especially the EU. I think I've made three different visits to Brussels in this capacity in order to meet with uh, people, including how, you know, valuing the Brussels Forum as a venue to come and make sure that we are discussing, explaining, coordinating on that. So I think it's critically important. Okay. And I just want to say that uh, in the EU, we are very saddened by the uh, appreciation or lack thereof uh, uh, over the last uh, over the last year, or somewhat muted, especially in the top level rhetoric uh, views on the European Union. I'm not going to comment on the trade matters, as uh, we had a whole whole panel on that. And uh, I think that the Euro-Atlantic alliance is important for both sides of the Atlantic, and today uh, more so than before, because of the issues we discussed, because of uh, uh, assertive Russia and uh, China, and I very much hope that uh, we'll find a better way to coexist okay. for the benefit also of, of okay. our neighboring countries. We have a question, and again, just please identify yourself. And Hello, my ahead. name is Dave Ensberg from Netherlands. Uh, I work as his chairman at the school board in the Netherlands, and one of our teachers mm -hmm. flew in the summer of 2009, 2014 from Netherlands to Kuala Lumpur, and she flew okay. across Ukraine. Okay. She ah, was killed. Sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I should have seen where that was going. She was killed with the MH17 disaster, yeah. along with 297 other people. And a vast majority of them were Dutch. The Dutch uh, government has put on an investigation, but the Russian government has been really trying to uh, corrupt this investigation. And I was wondering, their parents, of, the, of, the, of my old school teacher, mm -hmm. she, they don't know what really happened, and the investigation is key to that. Mm -hmm. Will they ever know the truth? Okay, let's take another question because I'm not sure our panel can a answer it, but if they want to try, it's fine. I've got two minutes left, so I'm going to take one more question. You know, I have here this, this gentleman here, you. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, good morning. My name is Bruno Lete. I'm a senior fellow in, in GMAT right. Brussels. Right. 
Um, we've been talking a lot about Minsk and Normandy and hard security, but actually I, I want to talk about economic security for but Ukraine. Turn it into a question, please. How can we make not only the countries peaceful, how can we also make them prosperous? And what can EU and US do more in that term? Okay, great. So I will just kind of quickly go back. You've got about 30 seconds, 35 seconds each. Um, Mr. President. On the question. On, yeah, on the question, well, on yeah. the Dutch gentleman's plea, yeah. on whatever you want to say. Well, I just want to say, for Georgia, for Georgia, economic security means physical security because we have placed ourselves very naturally as an interconnector between major markets. And so if we will be secure, our economic issue and integration will be secure and the growths will be double, di double digits as, as we estimated. So the security comes first for Georgia and we are working really hard to achieve this. Ivana. Very briefly on MH17, um, Ukraine has actually given all the authority to the Dutch um, investigators to deal, to, to deal with the issue and we are providing all the information from us. I really hope, as we hope for every single Ukrainian citizen who has died in, during this war, that every single uh, life that was lost in MH17 tra tragedy, uh, the, the families of these people who uh, are deceased, um, they will know the truth. Uh, I'm sure th so, and I think that this is extremely needed also for the whole world. In terms of economic security, I think uh, that um, some positive steps uh, from EU side have been made in this direction because the uh, um, trade preferences that have been approved for Ukraine have been working in that direction and we are grateful for that, but I'm sure that this is a minimum minimal that could have been done, and if we think along these lines, we can definitely develop additional opportunities. But uh, we are, remember, we are coming from 2014 when we lost 20% of our economy to the war, uh, a pretty serious chunk of our uh, industrial potential, and, and we are still recovering from that, not to mention all the, all the transit wars, all the... All the um, mm, export law, law, wars that Russia is waiting, waging on us, uh, and we are trying to reorient uh, to, to other markets, including, obviously, the biggest um, EU market, and uh, we hope that association agreement implementation would help that as well. Thank you. So, right to you then, Katarina. And if I get up, I get yeah, I, extra uh, 30 seconds. Well, you get uh, an extra seven seconds. Um, <laughs> in fact, uh, from the precipice that Ivana mentioned, now Ukraine is growing and uh, people say it's not growing fast enough. Well, it's growing after two years of, of, uh, of almost falling over the cliff. Uh, the question, to, to, to answer your question by investment, and uh, we have now reoriented and very aggressively from supporting mostly governance reforms in the first part after the Maidan into, in, into uh, the external investment plan that applies to both of the countries, where we in fact want to also crowd in the private sector and, and are developing uh, a, a lot of concrete uh, investment. So that has mm -hmm. actually happened and hopefully within a year or two we will see the results. Right. Okay, well, thank you. First off, um, uh, thank you for bringing up the, the airliner and our hearts go out to the families of those uh, affected by this and uh, uh, who, who lost family members in this. I doubt there's a person in this room who doesn't know what happened. And I'm confident that the investigative report is going to demonstrate this conclusively. The question is what we're going to do as a result of that. Uh, and that, I don't know, that's a question I think governments are going to have to face, but, it, but I think it's clear. Um, on economic security, I can just come back to something we said earlier, which is that it is an open, fair, transparent, law-based economy that creates security for everybody and it creates opportunity. And everybody struggles with that. West Europe struggles with this in places. We struggle with it. And certainly in Ukraine, they have tremendous distortions in their economy. And uh, getting to that point is what's going to build it. And that's what we all have to be working toward. Great. Thank you to everyone. Thank you to the panel. Thank you for the audience. And now, off we go. <laughs>